Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Kendra Yates. I'm the administrator of the RIM section at the Division of Archives and Records Service. I'm also my division's records officer and the chief records officer for the state. Um, so today I want to tell you about a grisly project that I've been working on for the past year and a half. Um, I've been cleaning up 25 years worth of records from our network drives. So I originally used the skeletons in the closet metaphor uh, because of the time of year, it's almost Halloween, and the way that records can pile up like bones. Uh, then last month, I read a historical novel that took place in the French catacombs, and I thought, this is the ultimate closet full of skeletons. And my coworker, Heidi Stringham, who manages the research center, visited the catacombs two years ago and very graciously allowed me to use her photos for this presentation. So thank you, Heidi Stringham. Um, in the 1600s and 1700s, uh, Paris had a cemetery crisis. For over a thousand years, uh, they had been burying Parisians uh, in the same cemetery plots over and over. Uh, they would actually remove the bones from previous burials and put them in a, a charnel house, which is what you're seeing on the, the left, that photo or sketch is a charnel house. Um, and then they would just put more bodies in. Uh, the churches that owned the cemeteries got paid for every person buried. So they had a vested interest in allowing uh, the burials to go on. But the problem was there wasn't room for more corpses and the soil actually couldn't decompose the corpses anymore because it's kind of gross to talk about. But when a, a body decomposes, it leaves behind um, some fatty substances, um, sometimes called cadaver wax. And yes, they made candles and stuff from it pretty gross. Anyway, but there was so much of that in the soil that the soil couldn't decompose the bodies very effectively anymore. Um, and there really just wasn't room. So bodies would um, be only partially buried. They had a lot of decomposing corpses, we'll say, above ground. And the city stank. Um, and this went on for a long time. Um, multiple kings, uh, including Louis the Fourteenth and Fifteenth, um, said that cemeteries couldn't bury more bodies, um, but the cemeteries made money from it. And so they said, uh, no, that's OK. We really like making money, so we're going to keep doing it. Um, in 1780, this uh, culminated in a crisis when the, the wall between the cemetery that you see in this photo, actually, the um, I don't speak French, uh, so I don't want to slaughter this name, but Saints Innocence, Son Innocence or something, cemetery in Paris. Um, there was a broke uh, down and the contents of the cemetery spilled into that cellar um, and they never were able to get the smell out of it. But that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and the fact that this, uh, the French Revolution had started also meant there was um, more chaos, I guess you could say, um, but in the government. Uh, but the result was that they finally moved on it and did something. They, there were these um, old abandoned limestone quarries on the edges of the city, and they had been forgotten about for a while, but, but there was a cave in and people knew about them again at this time, and they decided to use those. And so they converted those into ossuaries, which is uh, a resting place for human skeletal remains. Um, and they called them catacombs. And they had to build tunnels and entryways and roads, that kind of thing, in order to facilitate the reuse of the space. Um, but there's like over 500 miles of uh, tunnels down there now. and. Um, something like that. Anyway, there's one mile where that's open to the public for a tour. Um, but over six million corpses are housed in these catacombs um, under Paris. And now, of course, the city has expanded, so uh, they're not on the fringes anymore. Um, the bones were moved um, from cemeteries and deposited in the catacombs as a unit. They usually tried to keep the the bodies together that were buried in a specific cemetery and often marked those 
uh, remains with the information about the cemetery they came from. I like this one, and this is Google Translate, so forgive me if it's not accurate, but it says, Bones of the Ancient Cemetery of the Magdalene. And then it gives its address, um, deposited in 1844 in the Western Ossuary and transferred to the catacombs in September 1850. Um, or this one, which I swear it says, Dem Bones from the St. Lawrence Church, deposited April 17th, 1871. I don't know what the DM actually means, but um, if you think about it, it's probably tens of thousands of people represented by this one sign. Um, and here's one from 1787, uh, Bones of Cemetery of St. Eustache, I don't know, uh, deposited in May 1787. Um, or these ones, Bones Collected Under the Pavement of the Church of St. Nicholas of the Fields, deposited in 1859 in the Western Ossuary and transferred to the catacombs in September 1859. So it's pretty cool. They gave that much information, um, sort of like the provenance of the bones, right? Um, but some cemeteries actually didn't get any plaques at all, um, including Aransas Cemetery, which was one of four cemeteries used for guillotine victims um, buried during the French Revolution. And so in that cemetery, uh, Maximilian Robespierre was there, one of the leaders of the revolution. And Madame Elizabeth, King Louis the 16th sister, was also. And so later when King Louis the uh, 17th, 18th, came looking for her, he was, um, her bones, he was, he was, um, her remains, he was disappointed that the, he wouldn't actually be able to find where in the catacombs they were. So, so what do you think about the catacombs as a solution for the cemetery crisis in Paris? Is it creepy? Is it clever? Is it creative? Is it crisis driven? Uh, certainly not without consequence. Um, although the catacombs offered space to bury the dead, they presented disadvantages to building structures above ground. Uh, because the catacombs are directly under the Paris streets, large foundations cannot be built, and cave-ins have destroyed buildings. This is why there are very few tall buildings in Paris, only one skyscraper within the city limits, um, actually. So their decisions impacted the very foundation of their city, and to this day continue to impose limits on their growth. Although you could argue that aesthetically, that's definitely a, um, a benefit for the city. Um, so what does this have to do with records management? Well, shared network drives are like those 1,000 year old Parisian cemeteries. At the State Archives, we just kept burying more and more bodies in our uh, network drive past the point of saturation. Um, and it had never systematically been organized. When I started at the archive six and a half years ago, I tried a few times to look for useful records on the shared drive, and instead I found chaos. It was so bad that I decided not to use it at all for my own records. I only went there uh, for things I was specifically told to find there um, with detailed instructions on how to find them, sort of like a map. <laughs> um, and then the shared drive became too full. We were told to delete excess and unused files. So maybe a few of us deleted a few files, but it was like a drop in the ocean. It didn't make a dent in the problem. We didn't change our processes, so the skeletons continued to multiply. When it became too full, our database would freeze because it didn't have enough server space to function, and foundational services would fail. Uh, and in the face of the immediate crisis, we would throw more money at the problem. Uh, we would pay IT or DTS is the, the name for the state's IT, uh, to increase our server space. And then we'd just continue doing what we'd been doing, and then that server space would fill up and the cycle would repeat. And old files would just get further and further buried, not identified well enough to be retrievable. Not used, not managed, just decaying. If obsolescence and data rot had a smell, then our shared server smelled like a cellar full of rotting corpses. So something had to change. In April 2019, my director, Ken Williams, gave me the assignment to move agency records off of shared drives. Um, I, I call them all the H drive, that's what we call our shared drives, but really it's three um, different ones, but um, if I call it the H drive, you'll know what I'm talking about. So he wanted everything moved off of there um, to Google shared drives, which 
have free storage up to a point. Um, so we decided to do this to save money on constantly expanding server space, to organize our records, to apply retention schedules and stop hoarding records, and just to end the madness, end the cycle, and stop or slow the growth of unorganized records. And this task required multiple components, really. Um, project management was part of it. Records management was part of it. And change management was a big part of it. Uh, change management is helping people handle the change. So to begin our project, we determined what we wanted to do, what our goals were, and what the timeline was, and also uh, talked about constraints, like we needed to follow retention schedules, um, couldn't just delete it all. Um, and we also wanted to delete things that, that weren't needing to be kept. Um, so retention schedules were important. Also, um, although I was told to collaborate with staff and train staff, um, I was the only person dedicated to the project. Um, and then resources, like DTS, it was kind of an unknown how much they would be able to help, uh, but they've proven to be very helpful at certain points in the project. So, um, and then another division in our department had already done this, um, and so um, Ken told me the point person on their project, and, um, and she turned out to be a good resource at the beginning when I had some questions um, about how to organize the drives. So I researched tools and methods. I learned about Google Team Drives um, from DTS and online. Um, and I learned about Google Drive file stream, which I'll talk more about later. Uh, I talked to the others that had done this to learn about their, their methods. I experimented with uh, directory printer programs, which give you the report about the folder contents in an easy to read and ready to print uh, format. And I looked into file and folder copying and moving programs. Um, a lot of these are free, by the way. Um, but yeah, there are some out there and they'll create a queue uh, that you can load up for either copying or moving files. Um, and they also have features that will verify um, the actions to reduce accidental deletion. Uh, and then I experimented on my own drive. I analyzed a few of my own folders um, using one of those free directory printer programs. And I looked at the issues that I had with file naming and placement and listed possible strategies, um, solutions, and behaviors to avoid or fix the problems. And then I reorganized my own drive with better folder names and deleted extraneous items and um, tested it out for a little while to see how, how it was working for me and, and think about um, my own user patterns. Um, it was pretty crazy because I found inconsistent naming and organization of files, even though I was the one that named them all and did all of the organizing. Um, so that tells you how bad the, the shared networks are, right? Um, then we strategized, um, planned, prioritized our steps. Um, so one thing that was critical to determine up front was um, whether timeline was more important or the outcome, the organization of the drive. And, and my director um, felt like the organization of the drive was as important as saving money. And so the method was more important than the timeline. So that was really good to establish that with, um, with him and and know that I had that administrative support for doing it right um, as opposed to just rushing and, and trying to do it fast. So some of the questions we had to think about as we were strategizing, um, how did we want to organize and name the drives? Um, how many team drives did we want to create? Um, I ended up deciding on three um, so that we could have some non-public materials in the drives with certain users having access to them. Um, one thing uh, in with the shared drives in Google, whoever you give access to the drive to has access to everything on the drive. There's not a way to say this item um, can only be seen by certain people. It's different in that way than their normal uh, Google My Drive. So, so that's why we had to create a drive that everybody had access to and then a drive maybe just for the person dealing with um, grammar requests, that kind of thing. Um, so 
we had to figure out what we wanted as our folder structure, which is called a file plan, um, and had to figure out where, whether we wanted that to be function-based um, or process-based, um, those folders. And, and there were going to be some records that had to stay on the old, the H drive. Um, and so just figuring out which ones those could be, um, could be allowed to do that. And how we would ma maintain the metadata for the files that we were moving from one place to another. Um, and how to get buy-in from staff, of course, is a big one. Um, and actually, Google File Drive File Stream is um, a great way to be able to move files and still retain the metadata. So that was one of the things that um, I learned. And that's why we use it. So um, then determining the file plan, um, getting started, and um, the process for that. So I looked at the current state of things on the H drive. I did a sampling of folders and photos and images was one of the folders I looked at and it was just, it was grim. It was overwhelming, um, but it did provide some insights into user behavior. Um, and some of the things that I observed, nested folders with the same name and similar contents. <laughs> um, staff turnover in a position often would lead to a whole new round of folders and files with the same types of records. Um, or sometimes people just forget uh, where they put something and they create a new one. But you'll see here, this <laughs> um, pretty funny. And then multiple copies of identical records overlooked uh, because they were organized in multiple folders or files were named different things. Um, in this case, it was just multiple folders. It was like total repeat um, of a subfolder within a folder. Um, also, there were things like Jane folders uh, for use by one person. Somebody just created a folder and named it for themselves, um, which is pretty useless for anyone else trying to find records, um, uh, especially if they're coming after you. Um, oh, and this was my favorite, the one MIP folder uh, MIP stands for most important person. So this is the person that didn't feel like they should have to scroll down to their folder. So they put a number in front of it. <laughs> and it wasn't named for them. It was just this particular folder was important to them. So they put a number in front of it. So it'd be at the top of the main folder. Kind of a pet peeve of mine, if you can. I uh, <clears throat> can't tell. So uh, there were previous attempts to organize. Um, probably 10 or more years before I got here. Um, but everything and trying to organize from within, um, I don't think it was a big project that everybody took on or knew about, just one person. And so um, everything that she didn't know uh, was hers or her sections. She dumped into the other sections folder, which happened to be our sections folder, which is why it was so bad when I started. Um, anyway, so whether it belonged there or not, um, it was like, this isn't mine, therefore it's theirs. Um, so that was kind of fun to see the after effects of that. And no one had ever been put in charge of any, any um, application of retention schedules and deleting records on the shared drive, and it showed so one of our previous records officers was a hoarder, and you could kind of see that too. So one of the things I learned was that not all records or not all archivists are necessarily records managers. Some of them really are uncomfortable with destroying records, um, even with retention schedules, right? So some of the goals in making a file plan, uh, what I wanted to do is make it function-based so that it could outlast title changes, right, um, staff turnover, and would cross organizational divides. But I also wanted it to be process-based um, so that it actually facilitated the natural workflow of staff. Um, but then the question is which staff, right? Um, because you'll have a record that's used in several different processes by different groups. Um, so where do you put that um, in whose workflow. Um, and then I wanted to distinguish between the division's current records and historical records transferred to us. Um, this gets especially confusing when there are historical records created by our division and we're supposed to transfer them to ourselves. So that that's part of the reason that people hadn't been doing that. It's just very confusing. Um, I wanted to make it usable so people would use it. Uh, I wanted to provide support to help 
staff understand the new tools um, and also see that even though it's new, it actually can work for them perhaps better than what they were doing before. Um, and then I wanted to provide training um, to help staff understand how they should interact with the shared drives, um, kind of the do's and don'ts, and hopefully get more uniformity um, across the staff. So I drafted a folder structure based on our functions and work processes. And I reviewed it with the other RIM specialists. Um, and then I got staff input through an activity called Sticky Note Sort Activity. So I'm going to kind of explain this activity because it was um, really quite fun. Um, staff members were divided into cross-sectional groups in order to provide different perspectives as they discussed um, things. And each group was given verbal and written instructions um, that you see on the right there. And they were given three sets of pre-printed sticky notes, which took a while to do. Um, but I got the templates from, I should give her a shout out, um, uh, from eMERGE um, Consulting. We used them for an audit and Charmaine Brooks um, did an activity at an ARMA um, spring seminar where she had us do this um, for a small sampling of things and I thought that was really, really a good activity. So I contacted her and she provided her templates for me so that I was able to go in and, and do this um, applying our own um, file names and things that I was proposing. So, so the, the large sticky notes are labeled with functions. They're the top level folders. The medium purple ones are labeled with processes and those would be like your first or your next tier of subfolders and maybe the tier under that as well. And then the small ones are labeled with record types, um, actual records that you might find within those folders, right? So that's kind of the idea. So step one, uh, as a group, they had to decide which broad function each process belonged to and place the sticky note under that function. Um, step two, they had to go through the record types and, and decide which, one, which processes resulted in those records being created and then place those labeled sticky notes under those processes. Um, step three, I asked them to suggest alternative terminology uh, that makes uh, sense to them if, if the terms I used were confusing or they just um, felt like something else would be better. And also I asked them to identify gaps or overlaps in processes or record types because those are, um, especially those overlaps are problematic areas or um, it can be hard to decide how to organize it and everybody will do it their own way. Um, so. Um, and then every group organized things differently. It was really fun to see their process and the results. Um, but patterns did emerge. I, I was able to see some common user experiences and get some great input. Um, the activity ended with a discussion about the challenges of categorizing and labeling records uniformly. And this discussion gave them the opportunity to see patterns and problems caused by vague folder names like administrative, or project files, um, and to think about the challenges of organizing and naming things in a way that makes sense to multiple people, let alone everybody, right? Um, so after the staff activity, I reviewed and documented all of the feedback that staff had provided. Um, and then I adjusted the folder structure and names based on the user patterns and the feedback from staff. And the result was our final division file plan. So I did this activity partially to get their feedback about, about the folder structure and names, uh, but also to help staff understand the difficulty of the task. I felt that this would help them be more willing to change their processes when the time came. At least I hoped it would help them um, be more willing to embrace the change. Uh, the most important part of any project really is helping people make the changes necessary to implement the new processes, otherwise you just you don't get results, nothing changes. So my strategy for change management was to communicate about the project and expectations, to solicit and act on their feedback, um, to provide training, and then to monitor data changes on the H drive and do it myself if necessary.
So I communicated early on and all throughout the process I tried to. Uh, I told them in staff meetings and newsletters. Um, I told them who had decided to do it. In other words, I've got support of you know top level administration, who would be affected by the change, which is everybody, uh, who would be responsible for what tasks and who to ask for help and explained why we did it and what problems we were trying trying to solve with um, this change and how it would benefit them. Um, I tried to keep them in the loop as far as timeline, how and when we were doing what things and what to expect, um, what was happening and where their records would be um, going forward. So I used a variety of methods for training staff in these new processes. Early on, I created um, two learning paths in LinkedIn Learning about Google G Suite and Google Drive products, one that was for beginners and one for intermediate um, you or advanced users. And all staff had to complete one of the paths. They didn't have to do both. Um, but they had to do one. Uh, I got Google Drive file stream installed on everybody's computers um, for them and sent them an email explaining its value as a tool. Um, what it does, it's designed to simulate Microsoft Windows File Explorer. So it makes using Google Drive uh, familiar to Windows users, makes it so that you can access it outside of a browser, um, move folders, access records um, in a way that's looks just like Windows. Um, after sticky note um, activity and creating the file plan and the folders in the new drives, I created a guideline, um, do's and don'ts for using the Google shared drives and, and kind of explained the categories. Um, during the next staff meeting, which was last year, October 28th of last year, I explained the file plan to them and gave them the guideline and asked them to begin moving their records over. Um, not surprisingly, it didn't happen very quickly or not a lot was happening. So I began moving some files over, the low hanging fruit. Um, obvious matches, um, those that were in my own folders, that kind of thing. Uh, and that was about it for the first few months, but I didn't stop talking about it. A few people that were kind of more willing to embrace change came to me with questions um, as they were trying to work things out. Um, and and to help further it, to help them customize their folders in the new drive, I met with work groups and individuals to learn about their processes and needs, which was really interesting. Um, surprisingly, it was actually helpful for them to discuss their processes with each other when we did it as a group. There were areas where each individual was actually doing things their own way. Um, so my job was to ask good questions, to keep conversation going and pull out the information we needed to listen and to take good notes. Um, so through these conversations, I realized that I should have made action items more clear. I, I realized I hadn't communicated as well as I thought I had um, to the, the staff as a whole. Um, but they needed to know that I was not going to create the deeper level folder structures in most cases because those really need to accommodate their workflows. Um, that needs to fit like like a fitted jacket, like a tailored jacket. You know, if I make those, they won't they won't quite fit right um, at the very you know the lower levels. Um, so we also discovered there were processes where more standardization would have been beneficial. And so you know during the conversation that was acknowledged, um, but I was careful not to step in that mess because. <laughs> Not my circus, not my monkeys, right? Um, so these conversations could also happen via email, which worked really well in some cases and was a disaster in others. Um, virtual meetings were sufficient in some cases, but not all. Some staff members needed face-to-face -face interaction, uh, which was very difficult because the quarantine was in fact uh, by this time. So based on some of these conversations, I began moving some regularly regularly used files over, um, which stepped up the involvement of coworkers because now their records that they were using were elsewhere. Um, for instance, the records transfer sheets, the RTSs, the record transfer forms that we use, um, these are critical records that document um, when records are transferred either to the record center or to the state archives. Um, and 
They're used by multiple sections for different purposes. Uh, like I said, they're regularly used files and they're important. So I emptied the folder in the shared drive except for one document which I created which was titled where did the RTSs go? Because <laughs> I wanted I wanted them to find something if they were looking for them there. So the folder looks the same when they open it that's what they found um, and when they opened that it told them where to find them on the shared drive, the new shared drive. So I also emailed staff to let them know and to remind them that Google Drive file stream would be a much better way to access huge folders like this one. So I was reminding them this tool, this particular tool <laughs> will be good. You'll love it, promise. Um, some staff members really needed the face-to-face -face interaction, like I said. Um, so be during the quarantine, there were only certain days that this person came in. Um, and I hired a new um, RIM specialist, and so I started coming in at the beginning of July. So that's when I found her on a day that she came in. She was mostly coming in on Saturdays, but um, uh, because she's in the high risk category. So I, I came in and um, met with her and showed her how to do what she needed to do. I was trying to email her, I guess I'll just tell you, I was trying to email her to ask her, how do you want your folders? arranged in the new drive like what makes sense to you um how do you access them and the email it just was not working at all it it was and the phone didn't work um so so i just we did it a face to face and what i did is i just had her show me her process and took notes and showed her then how much easier it was to do her process um with the new drive instead of the, the old drive and it actually cuts out some steps um, and and then about a month later she couldn't find the folders um, and so I walked her through it again face to face um, but I realized <laughs> this could go on indefinitely uh, that she really needed to see the process she's a visual learner and so words describing the process were not going to work for her um, so um, but I wouldn't always be here when she needed, and actually that's what had happened. She needed them the, before I got in, and it was a very stressful thing for her. So I created some video tutorials where I recorded my screen as I went through the steps of her process, um, just giving her tips and explaining what I was doing so she could watch the training whenever she needed it. Um, and I didn't need to be here to take her through that visual um, visualization. So. In general, I communicated with uh, the staff through email um, if I was moving or or was going to move records from their folders to the shared drive. Um, and I provided the file address so that they could find it and I also usually linked to it so they could click, but I wanted them to learn how to navigate to it as well. So I usually um, relied on the file address itself. So one time, I forgot to communicate with them that I had moved folders um, one time, okay? I spent hours moving records one evening last month from a particular part of our drive um, that we shared. It was this drive that we were sharing with um, Division Department of Heritage and Arts Division of History for the Research Center. Um, and they actually, we'd learned they, through a meeting with this group that they hadn't had access to that drive in three years. So here we were thinking we needed to keep this drive um, to accommodate them and no, not true. Anyway, so I was moving everything off of there. Um, I had met with them, but it had been probably three or four weeks since I had met with them. And we didn't actually say when I was going to start moving things. Um, but I was ready to move, so I started um, moving things, and I didn't even email them to tell them, which was my biggest mistake. All right, I'm sorry. So the next morning, they found the records missing, and they contacted DTS to restore the files because they thought that there, some glitch in the system had just vanished the files. Uh, so that was a few hours of their morning and DTS's time. And I had to apologize and then I had to redo the work because they had had DTS restore the files. <sighs> so that was kind of dumb, <laughs> um, which was fine because now I knew exactly what I was going to do with all of them. I had already moved them so they were okay in the shared drive. I just had to go through and delete all of the stuff that they had added. So this time I communicated well in advance. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm really, really, really sorry. 
So this is probably when I, I began to scare them a little bit. Uh, they realized that no one's records were safe from my eager mouse button. And I have been very careful, though, not to destroy records that were still needed. Uh, if I wasn't sure, I moved them instead of deleting them. Um, and I should also point out, point out that there were some people on staff who were helping to delete duplicate files and move their own records off of the home directory. So the home directory, it's on the, that's the third one, right? I told you there were three on the H drive. So the home directory is where people have their own uh, file, their own on the shared thing, but nobody else has access to it. Does that make sense? It's on the network drive. That's a better way to put it. It's on the network drive, but it's theirs. Well, we pay for all of that storage too, right? Um, and it shows up, I'll, I'll show you. You'll see that later on a, on a report. But um, so, so Ken Williams, the director actually, uh, he was spending time weekly to weed duplicate files um, and remove his own non-historical records. So I think he finds it therapeutic. He's, he likes the house burning like I do. Um, and the RIM specialists removed their things off of the H drive and home directories at the beginning of the project if they hadn't done it before. Really, I think all of them were like, this is ridiculous, I'm not using this. So, so we had very little on there. Uh, so the disruptions to their processes were minimal, to say the least. Um, and so I tried to be sympathetic to those who had been embroiled on that drive for a very long time. Um, but really, some archivists make terrible records managers. <laughs> they just don't like destroying records. Uh, they never feel comfortable with it. Um, but giving them a process and a way to document it in a destruction log and things like that has helped. I've seen some improvement. But um, people are just funny about change. Um, some of my coworkers are still reluctant to stop using the H drive, but they don't say anything to me about it. They've never said anything to me about it. Um, they haven't asked for help. They haven't said, I really don't want to do this. They just keep using it. Uh, I think they're just hoping to wear me down, right? <laughs> and so I realized a few months after asking them to move files that I didn't have a very good way to see whether files were being moved off of the drive or not, uh, except by opening it and looking in each folder, which I didn't want to do, or, or doing a folder report on my own. But I really wanted um, DTS to do that for me. <laughs> so I worked to find out who at DTS could help me see more data about our drives. Once I had um, his name, his name's Sean Barlow. He and I are besties now. Um, so over the course of a couple conversations, he understood what I wanted to know, and, and I understood how to read the reports that he sent to me. Uh, this is the first one I got from him. It shows how much free disk space we had on our H drive. So that would be all three of those drives, right? Um, from July 2019 to May 4th, 2020. So I wanted to see what had happened over the course of the project up to that point. Um, it was May 4th was when I requested it. So that's what he was able to do for me the fiscal year up to that day. If the line goes up on this graph, that means that we have more space on the drive. So that's good. That means um, that things were moved off or deleted or drive space was added. But you can see the line jump up as I moved things off in December. That's when I moved the RTSs actually off was in December. And you can see the line go up uh, and January. And then somebody added a bunch of stuff the last week of January. So, so though this report is helpful, it doesn't tell me where it was added or who added it. So the next month, I asked for reports for each of the drives on the network. So he sent me the month's data for the main archives drive. This is the, where the bulk of the things are. Um, and you can see that someone added a lot of records to it during the last week of May. Um, this is the research center drive that we shared with Division of History. Um, and you can see that it was actually lightening its load the last week of May, which makes you wonder, did somebody move things off of this onto the shared? Obviously, no, but uh, an individual employee home directory. So this it's called users, right? This is everybody's own personal one on the shared server. Um, so somebody obviously cleaned off their drive, their home directory in the middle of May. It may have been Ken. Um, so when my DTS contact sent me this information for June, July, and August, it left me wanting more data. I wanted to know who moved data onto the drives and when. So he reported, he uh, provided me with a report uh, a few weeks ago that shows all of the files added to the H drive for the, pre uh, for, uh, to any of those three drives, I should say, for the preceding 45 days. So I analyzed it to see who was still using the H drive for non-sanctioned purposes. 
and then I targeted their files the next day after warning them. It's really been very enjoyable. <laughs> this is the best part of the project so far. Um, I didn't get into users like people's personal drives on the shared. I don't actually have access to those. Um, I could get it, I think, if I really needed it. But but so far, I've been focusing on the other on the other things. So, where are we in this project? What are the results? What's the status? Um, well, it's been almost a year since the staff meeting where I gave them the go ahead to move files. And um, as you can see, I've been doing the bulk of moving files. Um, but I think people have moved things off um, more than they've moved things over. Um, anyway, but reformatting or micrographics, as they've been called, um, I still need to help them. I coach them through the change and move their folders, but that's going to take a little uh, tact and diplomacy. And so I'm saving that, but I will, I just want to be careful about it and, and be there like uh, to help them with it. And the photo drive, we still need to tackle, which really it's a bear. Uh, we'd like a DAM, a digital asset management system for these photos um, so that we can put all kinds of tags on them and you can just go in and say like girl in red shirt or house burning, you know, and find what you're looking for. Um, so that's our end goal with those. Um, and I still need to help. So processing that I worked with, they had some things, some standardization of their processes that they wanted to kind of work through a little bit and decide on what subfolders they needed for those uh, processes. So I'm kind of waiting in the wings while they're doing that. Um, and then I'll make sure that they have what they need for that. Uh, this is the report from last week of the shared drives. You can see it's all beautifully blue, no red. Um, and actually, just so you understand what this means, you see that there's exactly the same amount of space on every drive. That's because they measure all of these together, right? Um, we have that encrypted drive, which has one item on it um, that needs to be on an encrypted drive. So that might stay. Um, but yeah, so that's just how much is on is available across all of those. Uh, the UHRC one is actually totally empty. That's the research center stuff that I, uh, I've completely moved everything off of it. But you, when you look at this, it doesn't look like it. So, so really that is telling us what's on the H drive and then the user's drive in my home directory is totally empty too. So, so what we're looking at is the H drive um, and I'm looking into getting those other ones deleted, um, the UHRC drive deleted because I don't wanna look at that. Um, anyway, so, so I'm, I'm looking forward to finishing up the last of it. I really wanted to get it done before giving this presentation, but it just it just wasn't possible. Um, but it has been really good to have this as a deadline to really kind of get me pushing the envelope. And then I have discovered how fun that is. And so I, I'm not worried. Um, so just kind of looking back at some of the, the results, um, the benefits that I see or not, I guess, but I, I think it's been beneficial. The server space has been freed up. The cycle of madness stopped um, and server space has been repurposed, which is why there's still so much on that H drive. Um, we are allowing them to put accessioned electronic records on there um, because we need more storage for those. And until we get a really good solution in place for that, um, the H drive is proving to be a great place. It gets backed up every day. So, um, so it's, pretty good, it's just kind of expensive storage, but um, but that's why there's so much on there. Uh, where was that? Um, about 35,000 files were added by our electronic uh, records archivist in two days. So she's, <laughs> she's going gangbusters on that, she likes that. So um, it's been repurposed for that. Um, the Google shared drives have facilitated teleworking um, really well because you don't have to be on the VPN, um, the virtual protected network. Is that what it's 
that stands for, uh, you don't have to be on that in order to access them, uh, which means you don't have to have a work computer. And when the pandemic hit, and this 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 really became a huge benefit for everybody to be able to, be able to access the, the drives um, and the records on them. Um, I would say I've learned more about coworkers' processes through this project, and I think they have as well. And we found areas of our business that need a little improvement, and that's always a good thing. And records are easier to find on the new shared drives, which saves time. And we have shored up our Swiss cheese foundation, so to speak. And we've also rediscovered some valuable records that had been buried under the bones, which makes the closets not so scary anymore. So that's all I have for the formal presentation. Do you guys have any questions for me? Kendra, you're still muted. Um, yeah, so just let me know if you have any questions. Um, Rosanna Benali Sag, I hope I'm saying that right, wants to know uh, where to find information about Google File Stream. Um, DTS actually had some information about it, um, but I also I did some googling um, to and read from like Google's actual. Um, place. Uh, it is fantastic. It really is what made the Google shared drive tenable. It, it, I don't think it would work otherwise. By using the Google file stream, you can um, go in, like I said, it's just like a Windows Explorer. And so you go in and you can open up the files next to each other, drag and drop, um, just like you would there, as opposed to you going through the browser the way that Google has set up its its drives through the browsers. Um, anyway, so yeah, it's definitely helped a lot, and it keeps the metadata uh, with the record. So, hi Kendra, this is still Rosanna. Yes. So, um, so with the Google File Stream, is it because we're a small division and and um, we don't have access to the regular network um, from from work if we were to be logged into the system, but we're using a lot of Google documents, mm -hmm. spreadsheets, all of that. And so I'm trying to create, I want to create a better system um, because now we have just all these documents everywhere and the mm -hmm. owners are different. And so I think I'm just trying to find a, a, a good way to organize everything. Yeah, um, so the Google shared drive, okay, so if you're using Google, my drives, right? That's what you're talking about. Everybody has their own drive um, and sh can share, you can share documents across drives. Um, so that's what we had for for five years, we've had that. Um, so the shared drive works a little differently. Um, and I actually, so are you saying, uh, are you, you said you were a smaller division, are you not with the state? Is that what you're saying? Oh, no, we're under the Department of Heritage and Arts. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, but we are using what you said, the My Drive with each of the employees. Yeah. And so but I was just wondering if the Google Stream, or, or what is it, the Google File why Stream? Don't I, better? Why don't I share my screen and show you? Yeah. Okay, um, great. Let me do that. I don't know what all you guys are going to see. That's a little scary, um, but I'll just... I'm just going to do it. Let's see. Um, so let me move this out of the way. Okay. Tell me, can you see a person swimming? Is that what you're looking at? Yes. Okay. All right. So Google. So I guess I better. Okay. So Google. Um, It's slow because I'm sharing it. Uh, drive. So when I go to my Google Drive, 
Okay, over here on the left, I've got my drive. That's the normal that you're talking about. I like to set up this priority thing where I've got, these are the most recent things. These are workspaces I create that I can go right to. And then I've got this starred where I can go to folders that I use all the time, right? And there's my drive. So shared drives just goes, uh, you have DTS created. It doesn't cost anything, doesn't cost any extra. Um, but you'll need somebody to be in charge of doing that for your whole department, right? Um, so then I had them create these three. There's one for the whole depart or the whole division. That's this one. And this is how you usually get into Google Drives is through a browser, right? I'm just to have a browser tab open. And um, this one's for the State Records Committee, um, the members of the State Records Committee. That's where they can access their things, um, as well as Google or Google Grandma requests are on there as well. Um, and then the management one, which has almost nothing on it, but in case, you know. Um, so those are the three that I set up, but they work fine. I mean, you can you can put move folders in and out, but not really in bulk. So here's what Google Drive file stream looks like. Whoops, it opened in the other. Sorry, I have two monitors. So um, it's over here on the left, right here. It looks just like the network drives, right? And I can actually click on it over here too, but I usually, I, sorry, I usually do it here. So there it's showing me the exact same thing. It looks different. It looks like Windows Explorer. Windows File Explorer, right? Everything's organized the way it would be if it were one of these other drives. And that's one of the benefits. It looks really familiar to people uh, that don't want to have to learn a, a new system. But, but that means that I can just, oh, did it do it? Create, uh, there we go. So then I can drag and drop folders really easily from one to the other, just like I would in the, the, Microsoft Explorer's file explorer, um, right? It just behaves that way. So it's just really nice to have that versatility. The other thing that that does for you is it makes it so that if you need to save from an app that you have open onto the drive, you can navigate to it the same way you would any other folder. Um, so that gives you a shortcut. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that answered your questions sufficient, uh, sufficiently, but but really um, DTS can, oh, and I'll stop presenting. DTS can get you set up with that. You'll just need like top level support of it and somebody to be in charge of it. Um, okay. Yeah. No, that was really helpful. Um, and and uh, so then we would need to, I guess, make a request, I guess, before we even get go to DTS, um, get approval from our department of people. Yeah, I um, I don't know what it would look like to try it another way. To be honest, this was the way we we did it, and so DTS was very cooperative with me because it's it was my assignment, right? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what they would do if someone just rogue, you know, just said, "Hey, we need share drives." This is what I want to do. I don't. I don't know how they would respond to that, but I, I got the shared drives installed by putting in a DTS ticket. And then to get Google Drive file stream on everyone's computers, I went around and got the computer serial numbers for every computer and put in one, one ticket to DTS with a complete list of all of the computers I wanted it put on. Okay. And then after they did it, I had to help a lot of people find it on theirs. It just behaves a little strangely on some computers. so. That that was kind of that process. So. Okay, thank you, Kendra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> She said, now whenever I think of skeletons, I'll think bit rot. <laughs> so. 
All right, well, if no one else has any questions, I think we can wrap this up and say thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. And um, I didn't put my contact information on there, but I'm Kendra Yates at utah.gov. So if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Well, thank you.